Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firkin, where we take a shorter look at certain components of the day in the life of ServiceNow developers. I'm joined with Dorian, so let's get right into it. Dorian, what do we got for today? Yeah, so today we got um, building on top of our script includes. So we're mm-hmm. going to do a different pattern. Last time we talked about the function pattern and some of the yes. pros and cons of it being a little hard to organize and you just have a lot of single function uh, uses. But mm-hmm. so we're going to talk about how to potentially organize some of those functions using a namespace pattern. So really taking it to the to the next step. Okay. Um, so let me share this screen and remember which one I screen I was on. <laughs> Don't share uh, the wrong thing. No, yeah, we're good. All right. So, so essentially following the similar um, pattern, you know, we're following what this call is called the namespace pattern. Um, and really the structure is in the function pattern, it was just some function and then it does some work. In this case, we're essentially naming or organizing our, our, our functions to do similar related things. Um, and so it'll look something like this, where you have this you know, script include pattern, it has some functions underneath it, and then those functions just get called very, very similarly. Now notice here some things to call out is there's no um, uh, like a parens in the beginning, mm-hmm. so that's something to to keep in mind. And so going back to you know what we had some pros for it is it allows you to organize um, your function patterns essentially. So this is like a really good use case for like utility functions. So if you did want to create a util, like this is a good example and ServiceNow provides some examples out of the box that you can go and explore um, in order to, to, to read about it. Um, some cons that I've noticed, um, there is no syntax highlighting when you, uh, when you use this API. So just keep that in mind that like when you do want to call it and I'll show it, like it's not going to highlight that it's like it actually exists in the system. And then, you know, continuing on the path of, you know, your properties and your functions aren't truly private. Um, okay, I, I was going to ask that because I saw you had one down there and I was like, are they truly private or just private to you? <laughs> yeah, not, not yet. <laughs> so, and and so, so that this should look very similar. I didn't do any other, you know, this code change is still the same that we had in our other functions. Um, and similarly, I created an ATF for us to test this. So again, oh, okay. nothing, nothing different here. We have, you know, your first name and email and locked out for params. We have an example of a, a, a user that is locked out and a user that isn't locked out. And then we have our three basic test steps where we create this user, we then run our, our script include, and then we, we do some validation in the script include, um, but also validation after, um, after the script is done. So if I click into this, you know, script again, so similarly, you know, we're calling some variables um, from the previous step. Uh, before we run our test, we then, you know, instantiate this object. So notice here, there is no uh, parents here in order to instantiate this. And then we do a, a little check to say, if the user is considered locked out, we then expect them to, the private function to lock out is to return true. And then we also want to validate that when we do set this locked out, it didn't actually update the user record. So that's why it says this should be equal to three. Um, and then similarly, we, we have that other if case, if they aren't locked out, um, then it should lock them out. And, and that's why this is here. The reason I did just a simple not equal to three is because actually in our code after it, it's gonna validate that they are locked out. So um, okay. don't have to worry there. So let's, uh, let's add some uh, debug statements here so we can uh, walk through this, or sorry, breakpoints. So one breakpoint, two breakpoints, debug test, pause before rollback, and we'll run this test. Still favorite functions of uh, San Diego. And let's go to our sys user table. 
so that we can you know, see that this user um, uh, just just ran. So it paused for our, our breakout. We can see that the first one is is already locked out. Um, we step over, which should then run our actual function. And so nothing changed here. There's no updates. And just to, to make sure the system is smart, it didn't update. And now our test should essentially pass. And so now we're essentially checking, is there anything else we want to explore here before, which we don't. So we're now finished, let it roll back that user, test passed. And so now we go here and it should be a new user, which is not locked out. And the update is zero, we step over. So then our function gets called and you see that they are now locked out and there is an update that has happened on it. So we step up, uh, ooh, we got a failed test. Oh boy. Man. Um, <laughs> uh, expected true. So, so here's an example where um, our test, I guess this is a good example, where our test failed for this person, um, or maybe my test is, is, is incorrect. But the idea here is what's nice is like you can, you know, kind of get some you know information related to your test um so yeah that shouldn't have uh, failed hmm. so let's see what my test is doing and uh it's saying that this should have been not equal to three um but let's see what other ones They've, they've all been failing. Oh wait, my last one succeeded. Weird. Let's uh, I just want to run this again. I'm very curious. Sometimes like, no, oh, no. Oh, all right, there's something wrong with our code. Sometimes there is some um, service now to blame, but no, not in this case. So one thing I want to check is how is our code different from our other script includes. So if we go to our functions pattern. This looks pretty much identical. Oh, maybe they're, these aren't identical. No, that, yeah, that last function is a bit different. So is locked out user. Because you're returning true or false, not uh, true or three. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I guess. I guess I did a terrible job of copying and pasting. So let's, let's well, fix it's because that that uh, that is the set lockout. Yeah. Um, well, so this is the this one, which this looks the same, right? So if it's the set lockout, um, this oh, yeah. looks mm -hmm. identical to to this. And then the this one looks identical to this one. Okay. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. I don't know. Good question. But I mean, we could we could spend a little bit more time debugging. But I think overall, I wanted to show that like <laughs> that the, the the actual script is working. And you know, because we want to keep these short, I won't go into to the full step debugging here to, to find it out. Sure. But at least we're showing an example of like, you know, this is what your unit test would look like um, if they do pass or fail. And you can see that like what is expected, um, but it, 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 it returned false, right? So you can, you can, you know, go through here and, and figure out um, like what, what actually happened. Right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, thoughts thoughts on that from a like architectural standpoint of the 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 name pattern versus the function pattern. Um, so to me, I don't know. I I'm so old school. I just I, I still love the original pattern. You know, the one that that everyone uses. Mm -hmm. um, this one. Uh, the namespace is close, closely related to that, mm -hmm. uh, or it feels like it's closely related because it works almost the same. You just don't have the parens and, and it, and it, uh, I don't see any like outside of that syntax highlighting, which 
you know, for someone who may be using VS code to, to write the scripts anyways, probably isn't a, a big matter. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, like this, uh, this syntax you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, without the prints, which I, I don't know, it, it seems like six of one, half a dozen, the other, right. If you're used to writing the, the original, um, pattern mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then changing over to this would be the easiest, but I, I don't see why you would, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't see a, a, a reason to, to move off the other one. Um, and maybe it's just because I haven't had a chance to use any other, <laughs> you know, like I, I haven't come across a use case where I've needed yeah. to change the pattern. Yeah. And it, it's interesting too, because like, you know, this person says the same thing, right? Like the mm -hmm. class pattern, <laughs> but it just doesn't have the class create and the new, right? So it, it really isn't uh, adding more value than just using the, the ServiceNow class one that I can see of. Like, I don't even know, maybe there is some memory management that it does differently, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to determine that easily. Sure. I mean, even then, are we talking, you know, millisecond <laughs> processing mm -hmm. differences or is there something more noticeable? Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I'm old school and I'd still fall back to just doing the old original pattern just because that's what I'm used to. And it works for, you know, almost all my use cases. Yeah. And I wonder totally. if the reason there are these different patterns out there are, is the same re, you know, is, is, due to different um, uh, groups building things, right? So you have group A that is used to doing one way mm -hmm. and group B that's wanting to do it, you know, they're, they're used to doing something different. Um, you can see a lot of that, like when I used to work on uh, um, oh, SharePoint, you'd mm -hmm. see a lot of that because there'd be these disparate teams that really just seem like they never communicated with anyone else. And so if they build their own stuff in a silo and and you get stuff like that yeah and, and i think that's the importance of the overall thing here right is we're trying to find the right architecture to to use for your script includes and even scripting so that you can easily unit test them so that's kind of like like choose a pattern and stick to it if it solves it and yeah. then if there are use cases where you need to use a different one use a different one so yeah yeah i i agree with that i do want to before we go at least lastly share the um where you can find some of these um, uh, snippets. So like, let's say you wanted to, to use this. So what I have here is this. So what we've done is from the last one, we included like an example here. So all you have to do is, you know, copy it into a script include. Um, and so this, you can find this at the Cask NX, you know, inside the barrel code snippets. And here's an example of the script include inside of the, the ATF. So, so most of the things that you would you, you would want to need. And then we just took a an example picture of you know what are all the pieces of uh, the ATF in order for you to to build it. So very um, nice, very handy. So we'll uh, upload another one um, for for this pattern as well, so that people can utilize it as an example. Perfect. Wonderful. All right. Anything else before we go, John? How, how many patterns are left? None? Are we so, done? Do them all? <laughs> no. So we still have the global include one, oh, which is a, okay. which is is actually a really cool pattern because it enables you to import like JavaScript from other places. Um, so oh, really? we'll do some some cool things with the global include, and then we have uh, one final pattern after that. So we have two more patterns. Okay. Perfect. Well, uh, I guess with that, um, we'll say adios. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe um, and uh, have a good day. Yeah. <laughs>